Um, welcome to um, this um, seminar, kindly, um, um, the a new perspectives on Russian Eurasian studies um, sort of in cooperation with the development of Russian law, which I represent led us in. Um, and uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to present uh, Radana Buenturiva, who is our visiting scholar and uh, who is um, a postdoctoral researcher of uh, Le Fonds National de la Recherche Scientifique, affiliated with the Centre de la Vie Politique, as I recall, at the University de Bruxelles in Belgium. And uh, Rajana has just finished her book, which is coming out with a uh, poll grave on LGBTQI activism. And I was very happy to endorse her book. Uh, it's a great book. So uh, also this is available in a form of a book, uh, Rajana is a political scientist. So today, as well, that's why also the uh, new perspectives are hosting us. So Rajana is going to talk about uh, the dynamics of LGBTQI protest activity uh, in uh, Russia. So um, you have about 40 minutes, and uh, those of you who are online, uh, if uh, you have any questions or opinions, ideas, please uh, put them in chat during the um, uh, talk, and I will respond to them uh, after, uh, of course, we uh, finish. But also do use chat to, to chat to each other, which helps uh, a lot also to uh, kick off uh, the talk. And of course, welcome to our audience. Uh, uh, and uh, Rajana, the floor is yours. So thank you very much uh, uh, for cheering uh, today and for hosting me here and for organizing and uh, to you and Marita. Uh, for organizing uh, my talks here. Uh, so today, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, this seminar is part of my promotional stuff about my book, which is uh, <laughs> going to be released next month uh, by Palgrave, and it's uh, called The Emergence and Development of LGBT Protest Activity in Russia. So uh, the book is built around the uh, social movement theories and the uh, mixed methods approach, uh, which also includes interviews with Russian uh, LGBT activists uh, from 10 Russian regions. So I built a theoretical framework uh, for which, which, which is suitable for the analysis of LGBT protest activity in authoritarian states. And I apply it uh, to the case of Russia. So what I say is uh, that uh, to get a full understanding of uh, the dynamics of LGBT protest activity in a uh, state that uh, display authoritarian tendencies, uh, it's best to examine like uh, several, uh, so the bunch of factors. Uh, one of the most crucial factors is activist motivation that is based on grievances and on collective identities. So if they don't, uh, see the situation as unjust, they wouldn't be motivated uh, to engage in protest. If also they don't identify themselves with an aggrieved group, they also wouldn't be motivated to engage in protest. But, uh, all right, so we have motivated activists, but then we need certain necessary conditions for them to be able to step towards protesting. And these necessary conditions are, they are jointly necessary for motivated activists to start protesting. So it could be like, this uh, necessary condition could be established, but if these are not established yet, then the protest activity wouldn't be happening or would decline, for example, if certain changes uh, start developing in the country. So uh, among these necessary conditions, I outline uh, the balance uh, between political freedoms and repression, which is political opportunities and constraints, also activist resources, which are activist networks, and uh, their individual resources, which is based on their age, their uh, financial resources, and their education, and uh, also perceptions. Uh, so they need to see the political situation in, in the country as uh, possible to protest. And also they need to perceive society as sufficiently tolerant to engage in protest and to play their certain demand. 
because like we are talking about LGBT protest activity. So if all these necessary conditions are in place and we have motivated activists, they might choose protesting as a suitable tactics, uh, tactic to achieve their goal, which is instrumentality of protest. So this is a necessary conditions and that is a crucial factor that is necessary, uh, that is needed. But also there is another uh, factor that I view as a contributory factor, which actually affects these factors and uh, that's the uh, direction of state foreign policy because it might affect how fast or if uh, networks between activists can actually be developing and also uh, the balance between uh, political freedoms and repression, it could affect it uh, in certain ways as well. And also I uh, uh, play the argument about the importance of regional differences in the, uh, when we apply this framework to a certain case, uh, especially in, the, in big countries such as Russia, these uh, factors might develop differently in different uh, regions and different places. So for example, in uh, more uh, cosmopolitan urban, uh, urban places, uh, these factors might be established earlier and uh, so that the local activists might start engaging in protests. And in some regions, these factors might not be established at all. So, local activists won't be engaged in the process despite uh, that their colleagues in other regions are engaging in the process. So, right, let's take a look about, uh, let's take a look on Russia. But first, before I'll delve into protest activity, I just like, I'd like to outline uh, the Russian LGBT movement. So, uh, Russian LGBT activism can be roughly divided into two waves. The first wave occurred in between mid 1980s, mid 1990s, and uh, activists and organizations of those period of time are mainly engaged in the development of LGBT identity and community. There were a few protests organized during that period of time, but they were a smaller number concentrated mostly in uh, bigger cities such as Moscow or even abroad. So for the most part, they were concerned with, uh, with the development of LGBT identity and community. And also, which is actually, it shows in the, some of the names, for example, uh, uh, the name of the organization, uh, the, one of the first uh, organizations of that period of time was named uh, uh, Moscow Association of Sexual Minorities, which also included sex workers. So they were like still searching uh, this like collective identity around which they could be uh, organized. Later on, that organization of sexual minorities was renamed the Moscow Association of Gays and Lesbians. So they started adopting Western uh, terms uh, and uh, identities. And uh, so this early activist organizations relied heavily on Western funding. And when by mid 90s, uh, this uh, source of funding decreased significantly, then uh, this, first of, uh, this, this first wave of activism also started to decline. So the next wave, this second wave, it, uh, it's happening for the last uh, two decades. So and um, this uh, wave of activism is characterized by uh, by an increased visibility, which is uh, which we can see through organizations of different pride events, uh, street protests, uh, interviews in the media. So, right, let's look at uh, protest activity. <laughs> so why didn't it occur during Soviet times? Right, uh, we would think that like uh, the answer is very straightforward. Uh, so there are like strong political constraints uh, which would apply to any kind of civic activism, any kind of protest activity, opposition protest activity of that period of time. So the balance was uh, screwed towards repression, uh, not towards political freedoms, right? And um, there was also a really high level of grievances uh, 
in regards to same-sex relations. Uh, and here is a uh, homosexual relations between men. So it was criminalized uh, in 1934. And uh, so this uh, same-sex relations between men are well, punishable uh, with imprisonment uh, of up to five years in prison. So there is no actually solid data how many men were put in prison during that period of time for these particular charges. But uh, it is uh, theorized that around uh, 1,000 men on an annual basis were put in prison for the charges of homosexuality. While uh, sexual intercourse is between female, between women, were not considered criminal offense. Uh, lesbianism was considered a psychological uh, <laughs> issue, so to say, and uh, those suspected of lesbianism were subjected to psychiatric treatment. So and, uh, due to all of that, there was also a high level of police harassment. Combined uh, uh, resource base for engaging in any kind of uh, activism, any kind of LGBT activism was severely underdeveloped because networks, uh, not even uh, between activists, but like uh, between non-heteronormative -heter uh, uh, individuals was very close and informal. It was based on uh, close friends networks or anonymous contacts in uh, saunas or other public spaces such as parks and street corners, things like that. So for these reasons, protest activity didn't occur. Right, so I say here it's early post-Soviet years, but I also uh, actually mean uh, mid 1980s Gorbachev era as well. So. Uh, what we see during uh, mid, uh, uh, mid to late 1980s and uh, 1990s, we see actually that uh, positive changes, positive political changes, establishing the balance between political freedoms and repression. So Gorbachev's policy of glassness initiate, that he initiated in the mid uh, 1980s it lowered the state control of the uh, information availability and uh, exchange, and it reduced greater freedom of speech and media. So Glasnost offered media more freedom to talk about different topics, including the topics of sexuality and same-sex relations. So during that period of time, we see also that uh, uh, press uh, that was specifically targeted on gays and lesbians, uh, they started to be published in those years. So favorable political opportunities meant that uh, there were like various uh, political parties and organizations engaging in protests. So the largest protest event uh, during that period of time was organized in March uh, 1991, uh, which involved around uh, 1 million people across the country that demanded uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the uh, resignation of Gorbachev and wanted uh, the candidate uh, and supported the candidacy of Yeltsin. But from then on until uh, the 2000s, there were not a lot of protests uh, organized during that period of time. The number of protests was very low, and those protests that were organized, they were mostly concerned about uh, economic uh, problems, such as unemployment and uh, the demands for uh, wages. So Russian economic situation of the 1990s was very difficult, extremely difficult. So uh, Russians as a whole didn't have sufficient uh, financial resources uh, and time to engage in protest activity. Uh, so uh, the balance uh, between political freedoms and repression was established. But at the same time, financial resources uh, were not enough to engage in protests. And also activist perceptions were not also in place uh, for LGBT protest activity. 
uh, to emerge and develop. At the same time, one could argue that uh, during that particular period of time, there were not a lot of grievances um, that would motivate uh, LGBT individuals uh, to participate in protests because uh, they would say that uh, uh, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1993, which happened actually due to um, uh, Russia more willing to embrace liberal uh, Western ideologies and ideas. And also, uh, as uh, Kohn argues, that uh, Russia wanted to be a part of uh, the Council of Europe. So, um, Therefore, uh, it might be viewed that uh, decriminalization of homosexuality removed a significant grievance. And uh, that's why LGBT people didn't want to protest because they thought that we are sufficiently free. But I see that there were a lot of grievances during that period of time around which uh, LGBT people could organize and protest uh, against. For example, uh, same-sex unions were not legally recognized by any law. And also the criminal law of the early Soviet, uh, of, of, of the early post-Soviet period actually discriminated between heterosexual and same-sex relations. It was only later on in 97 it uh, removed the discrimination, but there were not a lot of significant legal changes in that. So um, uh, a couple of words about transgender rights as well, because like I was mostly talking about the gays and lesbians, but transgender rights are also very important and uh, legally, it was possible to change the, the, the documentation, but it was like the process was very cumbersome and not very clear. And only until uh, 2018, uh, the process was uh, uh, simplified. And uh, trans, uh, transition related medication and surgeries were very expensive and not covered by public health insurance. So, protest activity emerged in the 2000s. So, but uh, why did it emerge during that particular period of time? So, LGBT identity and community were well developed by then. Activists uh, began identifying themselves as LGBT people and part of the LGBT community. Nowadays, uh, all LGBT activists uh, prefer to use the term LGBT when referring to their work rather than, for example, sexual minorities uh, that uh, was used by early activists. So uh, networks between activists were also developed, but in certain regions, for those regions to step towards protest in such regions as Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, and the far east of Russia. So how did these networks develop? Here I want to highlight the role of digital media. So first, uh, online uh, uh, forums and blogs, such uh, as on uh, LiveJournal, and then later on uh, Vkontakte and Facebook uh, became one of the main uh, ways of uh, communicating, exchanging information, uh, learning new terminology, and establishing contacts with each other. So, uh, the threshold for individual resources was also achieved. By that period of time, Russia's economic situation improved significantly, and which actually uh, led to the appearance of young, uh, well-educated, and financially uh, stable uh, population, which was uh, supporting uh, human rights and uh, democratic ideals and were willing to engage in trust. So uh, that period of time also demonstrated the increase of overall uh, protest activity across the country uh, with high number of protests and participants, very diverse uh, uh, groups such as left, right, feminist, anarchists, all of them started organizing and engaging uh, protests demanding uh, certain political reforms. So 
greater uh, political activity uh, across the country showed uh, LGBT activists the political possibility to start engaging in protests. Also, some LGBT uh, activists of that period of time started engaging in protesting because they saw their close environment, such as family members, friends, becoming more tolerant. And uh, also, the wide employment of uh, LGBT topics uh, by uh, television and uh, popular culture actually uh, helped uh, some activists to start believing that uh, the overall environment is becoming more and more tolerant. So, and uh, grievances uh, were also present at that period of time. So the regional legislatures started introducing negative legislative changes. For example, uh, because uh, now we know uh, all about uh, the federal law that bans propaganda of, uh, of non-traditional behavior to minors, right? But actually, uh, those changes started to be introduced at the, in the region first, and Rezan always was the first to introduce it. It was in 2006. So that was like one of the reasons that, that uh, around which uh, LGBT activists could actually organize. Also, uh, LGBT activists uh, uh, experience constant difficulties in trying to register their organizations. The regional authorities uh, uh, often refuse to register such organizations, even though legally there is no uh, legal ground to prohibit the, uh, the registration of such organizations. So during that period of time, one of the most visible uh, uh, event that happened is the uh, Moscow Pride. So I view the ban of the uh, first Moscow Pride march by the local authorities and the repressive actions by the police as a starting point for the emergence of uh, LGBT uh, protest activity in Russia. So LGBT activists uh, view the situation as unjust and wish to challenge that. So motivation based on grievances and also, but um, when they announced uh, their intention to organize private events, uh, so they announced that uh, as a twofold event, right? The indoors and outdoors. Indoors supposed to be cultural educational events, which were allowed because they were indoors, but outdoors uh, was planned as a march. And it's important to know that unlike those Pride uh, outdoors events uh, that are usually organized in the West, they are festive, uh, they are celebratory, but in Russia, it was uh, uh, from the start uh, intended as a protest event. So March was back. Uh, and that, uh, the Moscow authorities uh, said that uh, we are banning this march because we are concerned for the participant safety because of the local population. They wouldn't uh, be, they are not ready for that kind of stuff <laughs> happening on the streets. Right, so uh, despite the ban, uh, the Pride organizers de decided to go through the ban and uh, they went marching and uh, the march was violently attacked uh, by a homophobes and uh, activists were arrested by the police. So we see all the necessary conditions in place and uh, motivation is over the roof, grievances are there, uh, they see themselves as part of the grief group and they choose uh, protests as a suitable tactics to achieve their goal. So instrumentality was also in place. Another goal uh, for activists to uh, engage in protest, uh, why they, they chose protesting as a tactic was uh, visibility, right? To increase visibility, not uh, only to the wider Russian population, but also among uh, the LGBT community, which also pursued another additional goal is a recruitment. So visibility happened 
the goal was achieved in that regard, right? So everyone knew about the Pride Parade and uh, so it attracted public attention and it also attracted uh, violent reaction from this public, uh, from nationalist and religious groups. So since then, LGBT events uh, were often attacked uh, and harassed by homophobes. For example, this first uh, Moscow Pride March uh, was uh, attacked by some around 100 opponents in comparison only a few dozen activists participated in it. So, right. Next decade, or rather, so at first we see uh, that set, uh, grievances were significantly expanded and there, this expansion of grievances was facilitated by the state's promotion of conservatism. Uh, the Kremlin viewed that preserving traditional values uh, uh, was crucial for the country's survival and development. And here uh, I want to point out that it didn't happen in a vacuum. It also happened uh, in the background of certain geopolitical developments and the changes in Russia's foreign policy. So if uh, in the 90s, uh, especially in the early 90s, uh, ideas of embracing uh, and, uh, liberalism and closer relation with the West, uh, the beginning of the 2010s was already uh, kind of going under the, uh, in, in light of uh, increasing assertiveness toward the West. So the shift is in uh, uh, foreign policy was impacted by several developments such as the war in Iraq, the enlargement of uh, the European Union and NATO, uh, color revolution, uh, and uh, also uh, domestic developments such as uh, Russia's search for national identity. So uh, the Kremlin introduced several, uh, so to say, ideas. Uh, conservative is, is one of them. There was also uh, the uh, concept of uh, sovereign democracy and uh, uh, democratic multipolarity. So uh, the, the Kremlin uh, viewed sovereignty as a, an opportunity for Russia uh, to pursue its own developmental path, to be independent from international financial organizations, and also to become a more powerful player on in, in world politics. And multipolar, uh, multipolarity implies a variety of different interests in comparison uh, to American domination on the world stage. So, uh, but also, the state's promotion of conservatism was also uh, heavily impacted by uh, another domestic development and uh, uh, the regime's fear for its stability, which was uh, uh, protest against the election fraud uh, that uh, happened in 2011-2012. Uh, this protest involved for the most part uh, urban well of population uh, which supported uh, human rights and democratic ideals. And in the Kremlin's views, uh, the wider population, uh, the majority of Russians uh, were largely conservative, so uh, the promotion of conservatism was actually uh, one of the goals to attract uh, this uh, population to its goals. So uh, the promotion of conservatism was also uh, connected uh, with an increase in uh, socio-political role of religious leaders such as uh, Russian Orthodox Church and Muslim clerics. So uh, they, uh, these leaders actively advocated traditionalism and didn't support LGBT rights. <laughs> right, so... One of the crucial grievances that resulted uh, from all of these developments was actually adoption of this anti-LGBT propaganda law. First, it happened on the regional levels. So after Rizan, we see that several other regions in the span of the uh, three years between 2011 to 2013 
adopt uh, this law. It's uh, uh, in Arhangelsk, in Irkutsk, in Novosibirsk, in Krasnodar, so all over the place. And St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg was actually one of those uh, the discussion of uh, uh, this regional particular law actually um, uh, was one of the main motivators for many LGBT people across the country to start protesting. So uh, the federal law banning LGBT propaganda was adopted in 2013. And so then no other regions needed to adopt it because uh, due to the uh, Russian legislation, the federal law have the dominance uh, across the whole country. Also, another grievance uh, uh, that could be viewed that as not affecting uh, the Russian LGBT community, but actually it affects uh, LGBT rights itself. So uh, the Kremlin banned the adoption of uh, Russian children by uh, same-sex couples and also by heterosexual couples that come from those countries that legalize same-sex marriage. So, um, there was another significant grievance that uh, was instigated by state-sponsored homophobia, that is increase in violence. Uh, so during that period of time, the country saw the unparalleled spread of homophobic group and uh, activists who presented themselves as a vigilante group hunting uh, pedophiles because they used this uh, uh, terms interchangeably for them pedophiles or gays and were pedophiles. So <laughs> it was all wrapped up in one. And uh, they employed online uh, sources such as dating apps to hunt for their victims, uh, attack them and to uh, record these attacks and post them, them online later. So they used their anti LGBT propaganda law as an excuse for their actions. So these grievances facilitated the highest number of LGBT protests, uh, the highest number of participants, and wider geographical spread. But when I say the highest number of participants, we still need to remember it's only it was only a few hundred talks. It was it never happened as it happened, for example, in Turkey. Never like several thousands. Uh, no, it, it didn't uh, get to this uh, kind of uh, to this level of development. So, what is also important to remember that uh, Russia experienced other policy changes that impacted not only LGBT protest activity, but uh, uh, civic pro uh, protest, uh, civic activism, protest activity, and civil society. So uh, during that period of time, uh, we have uh, a lot of vaguely worded, arbitrary, interpreted, and applied laws that are used for repressive purposes. One of those uh, most impactful laws is the foreign agent law. Uh, it was adopted in 2012 and amended multiple times since then. And uh, the law requires politically active individuals and organizations that receive financial and informational organizational support from abroad to register as foreign agents. So nowadays the law includes media sources and individuals that distribute information on social media. So, Basically, any online blogger that posts uh, some political opinions can be labeled as foreign agent. If organizations fail to register as foreign agents, they face substantial fines. If individuals fail to do so, they fail. Uh, they face fines and imprisonment. Another uh, important law. Uh, which impacted uh, the development of uh, social movements in the country is the ban of uh, undesirable organizations. So uh, the law was adopted in 2015 and was amended multiple times since then. It bans uh, foreign and international uh, NGOs that threaten Russian security, uh, health, and public order. 
the law also uh, prohibits, uh, it doesn't also actually concern only foreign and national organizations, it also concerns Russian citizens and Russian organizations because it prohibits Russian citizens and organizations, even those that are located abroad, to work with undesirable organizations. So the label foreign agent doesn't uh, actually uh, prohibit the, the work of such individuals and organizations. It allows them to continue their work in the country, but under severe, severe restrictions. But being included in the list of undesirable organizations uh, prohibits all kinds of activity in Russia. So these kind of, uh, this, uh, undesirable organizations cannot open uh, representative offices, they cannot transfer money, and they cannot work on projects in the country. So organizations also can be banned under the anti-extremism law. The law lists several examples of extremist activities, which includes uh, forcible change of the constitutional order, justification of terrorism, um, also uh, it considers inciting social, racial, national, or religious strife, uh, claiming racial superiority, using neo-Nazi symbols as extremism. So, Organizations uh, engaged in such activities are banned. Participation in, in uh, such organizations is punishable by imprisonment of up to 10 years. While the list of these uh, extremist organizations uh, includes uh, quite legitimate, uh, so to say, targets, uh, such as terrorist organizations, but it also includes Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Majlis, uh, which is uh, an elected body that represents Crimean Tatar. So also uh, during that period of time, we see the tightening of administrative responsibility for violation of legislation on protests. So we see increase of fines, we see uh, threatening of administrative detention, and uh, also during that period of time, um, a new type of penalty was introduced, which is uh, compulsory work. So uh, also uh, criminal responsibility was introduced for repeated violation of the legislation on protest, uh, which is now punishable with up to five years in prison. And among the most recent developments is the uh, ban of fake news. It happened this spring. And at first, uh, it also it only concerned the dis dissemination of fake news regarding the, the military actions abroad. Now it concerns dissemination of fake news uh, about all Russian state bodies uh, working abroad. And the uh, dissemination of such fake news is punishable with severe fine up to uh, some around 13,000 euros and prison sentences of up to 15 years. Those who spread, those, uh, right, so you can <laughs> look it up later. So uh, what's happening? Because of this significant escalation of uh, repression, uh, we can see that the organization and conduction of LGBT protests became very problematic. So uh, nowadays, LGBT activists and organizations are frequently charged for violating the legislation on protests, uh, hooliganism, civil disobedience, uh, and LGBT propaganda. They are also uh, among the most frequently labeled as foreign agents. And being labeled as foreign agent is very, very harmful for their work because in public eyes, it builds uh, this uh, idea of them being uh, a traitor, a spy. So it, all, it further uh, feeds into public hostility combined with this idea of uh, non-heteronormative sexuality being foreign and brought from the West. So uh, the authorities frequently use anti-LGBT um, propaganda a lot to ban uh, LGBT events, uh, whether they are indoors or outdoors. And overall, uh, this law actually facilitates the growth of discrimination and violence against uh, the LGBT community. 
So nowadays, LGBT activists and uh, organizations are under con constant threat of violence. And even not activists and organizations, anyone who can be mistakenly or not mistakenly considered as identified as L belonging to LGBT community or supporting LGBT rights is also under threat of violence. So uh, in some regions, the authorities also became a pe uh, perpetrators of homophobic violence. We all remember the case of Chechnya. Uh, and so, these negative developments uh, caused the decline of uh, uh, LGBT protest activity in the country. So uh, a lot of LGBT activists uh, became unwilling to engage in protest and uh, chose other tactics uh, uh, such as litigation, or organization of cultural events, or even in, they emigrated. So, but for some uh, activists, however, the increase of violence and discrimination served as a strong motivator to continue engaging in protests. So they, they still engage in protest activity, but the number of protests, uh, number of uh, protest uh, uh, participants and the geographical spread decreased significantly. So what kind of protests uh, did they engage uh, during those years? So. Pride marches. Uh, Pride marches were chosen for a uh, specific reason, uh, which is visibility. Uh, the uh, choice of other protest uh, uh, types of protests was actually dictated by the legislation on organization of protest uh, in Russia, because uh, organization of protest that requires more than one participant actually. Uh, requires to file notification of it and to uh, obtain authorization approval by the local authority. So uh, single person tickets uh, doesn't require such an approval. Uh, you just file a notification and can go and stand with a banner. So it's easier to do so. Flash mobs were uh, particularly favored uh, by uh, LGBT activists for its nature uh, because they are sudden and quick. Uh, so, for example, rainbow flash mobs became uh, one of the most popular across the country and gathered a lot of participants. But also because uh, they had this uh, uh, floor being more festive because it was the release of balloons, colorful balloons in the air. Uh, so, thank you for your <laughs> attention, and that's basically it. Thank you very much.